Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Theophania's Foundations of the Craft, Module 2, the Praxis section. So let's go ahead and get started. So in the last of the Praxis sections, I had you working on a couple of different things. I had you establishing some very quick mechanism for communicating with the parts of yourself that are not the talking self and also working on grounding and centering. So today we are going to work on a couple of other very key topics. One of them is going to be purification and the next is going to be protection. So let's start with purification which is really about kind of spiritual hygiene and we know of course in physical health Hygiene is everything. It's really one of the foundations of physical health, and you will find that a very similar thing is true for spiritual health. So, why is it important? Good spiritual health requires good hygiene. We exist on all those different levels of reality that we just went through in the theory section, and we can get a little gunked up on any of them. So, when there is something wrong or when you're about to do a, a big working, it is especially important to be clean, to have all of your vehicles on all of your levels of being, being as clean and unimpeded as possible. Also, we talked briefly in the theory section about miasma. And whenever we are clearing or cleaning miasma, um, purification is always a first step in the healing process. So first, let's talk about individual just routine cleansing. And this is really just daily spiritual and energetic hygiene. And just like when you are doing your normal kind of taking care of your physical body, which is also a sacred act, I want you to consider adding into your routine some of this kind of um, spiritual cleansing as well. So I always say, you know, time is the ultimate scarce and valued resource of mortal beings. And so the more things of this sort of nature that are part of your daily practice that you just add in to the things that you are already doing in your life, the better. In addition to that, I also think it's really important that being a witch, being a magical practitioner, being a spiritual person is not something you do on a special 20 minutes that you set aside. It helps you integrate this magical way of living so that you are the magic into every part of your existence. So I'm going to recommend that you add into your routine when you are cleansing your bodies, to also be checking in and wash, cleanse the more subtle bodies. Those areas, if you remember all the different ranges of vibration, those that are more subtle, that are more rarefied than the physical. And there's a whole large range of them. So the more of this kind of thing, like I said, that can be incorporated into your daily routines, the more likely it is that you will do them. And it also can rarefy the rest of your life. So for example, when you're in the shower, as you're cleaning your physical body and doing it with intention, also then feel as the water is running into you, have it go down your various energetic centers, your chakras, and just see it cleaning out all of your centers. See it cleaning off your various auras. Um, you can also do things like, you know, so just when you're washing your face, when you're doing any of this sort of thing, just focus for a few minutes on allowing it to cleanse. Another thing that you can do is if you tend to work with uh, contacts or in a tradition in which spiritual purification is a part of it and you can work in part of that, so much the better. So I am a priestess of the god Apollon and I also serve as Montes. Now, Apollon has a very, very close relationship with Daphne. Daphne is the bay laurel and is sacred to Apollon. And I want you to put aside for a minute the mythology of like, oh, and then she ran away and it was terrible and he was chasing her and all that kind of stuff because the, there is 
a really big difference, as is often the case, between the mythology and then how it's understood in a ritual and how that actually works in cult, in the cult. So, um, you know, I have been very fortunate to be able to go to the main temple, one of the main temples of Apollon that is also dedicated very specifically to Daphne. It is now a church, but she is the part of the temple is still there and she is very present. So one of the things that I do, and I do this every morning, is a prayer. And I'm just offering this as an example. Holy Daphne, blessed bay. Great purifying nymph, beloved of Apollon, I ask you to please cleanse my head, my heart, my hands, my feet. Purify my mind, my soul, my words, my work, so I may come before my Lord Apollon Kathari as a white unspotted fleece. Okay, so that came to me when I was doing my trancy kind of work here. And my understanding of how this is working is I literally, I take and I see her power blessing and, and Bay is very, very, very potent for cleansing spiritual miasma and all sorts of pollution. So I see that infusing the water and then I wash like my head, my heart, my hands, my feet. So, you know, my head, I obviously do a lot of thinking work my heart, my feeling, my hands, which gives me the power to act in the world, and my feet that gives me the power to move in the world. And then my mind, my soul, my words, and my work. And then, that, so I may come before my Lord of Bolon Kathari, which is the Greek for clean, as a white unspotted fleece, which they were insistent on that language, which I was like, okay, when you get things that there's no way in hell you would ever make them up and they come from one of your contacts, that's usually a good indication that maybe you're getting something that is like very true and real for you. So I do that every morning. I work with Daphne and then I go in and I do some additional work with Up Alone. So, but having a moment in which I put that aside and I do this as part of my cleansing when I'm in the bathroom at the sink that you know helps you incorporate it into your day now when you're doing something bigger you might want to consider taking a ritual lustral bath and i would say doing this before a big ritual or you can do it as a set of workings or if there is something wrong however you feel that there's something wrong in your life it is not a bad idea to take and do a special ritual as a lustral bath. And this can be a ritual in and of itself. And it can also be preparatory, a preparatory ritual for additional rituals. So a bath is better. You can use a shower if you need to. At the moment, I don't have a bathtub. It doesn't work as well, I'm gonna be honest. But basically you run a bath of living water, which means it's a bit cool, unless the goal is to open up and sweat, which is a different kind of thing. And if you are led to do that, then you can do that. But a bit cool is more like the living water. And then you can add into it various things here. Salt is always good. You can add various kinds of herbs or teas. I often do, um, you know, I do a lot, as I said, with uh, Daphne, with Bay, especially as I'm doing uh, preparatory. There's a lot of preparatory bathing for when I do the, the work um, as Montes for a Bolon. And for that, I am often um, brewing bay leaves to make a pretty dark bay tea that I then add to the water. There are others that you can do um, like that with a number of different herbs. And that tends to get them more infused than just putting the herbs in. Um, you can charge the water. I would recommend that you charge the water. And what I mean by that is putting your hand in the water, envisioning the energetics and the thoughts that you want to infuse it with and have them flow through you, so flowing through you into the water. You can have candles and incense and transinduction kind of music as you're going through the bath. 
And basically a large part of what you're doing, and there's a few different ways to do this, you can step back into the amniotic fluids of the cosmos to be reborn. That is a very powerful way to do this as purification. There's lots of ways to do ritual baths that are not necessarily primarily about purification. You can step into moon water if you wanna take in the moon essence, at which point you're putting things in the bath to make it very lunar and you're seeing it become empowered with the power of the moon, shining silver, you can do the same thing with the sun was shining with sunlight. Um, you know, you can do a number of different kinds of workings with baths that are very powerful because one of the things to remember is that our largest organ is our skin and it actually takes in a lot. So, but for the purposes of cleansing, going back into the amniotic fluids of the cosmos, going back into the amniotic fluids of the great mother and emerging from the bath reborn allows you to go back and basically go through a reset. So an energetic reset and like get rid of everything so that you are being reborn and therefore being reborn as a purified being again, having like, left behind everything that needs to be left behind one of the things that i have is a ritual vessel it's a um again from the greek it's a particular kind of vessel that was used in the ritual purification baths actually before marriage and i have this one set aside specifically for those ritual purifying baths and I use it when I'm in the bath to be pouring water over my head and feeling everything run through. And I just pour and pour and pour until I feel all of the chakras, everything has been cleansed out of it. And I only use that for ritual bathing. So one thing I do want to point out here is do not put anything in a bath that is unsafe to consume. As I mentioned, your skin is your largest organ and we take in a lot through it. You will find in various traditions, magical traditions, purification bath recipes and so forth. Sometimes they've got very harsh elements in them. Do they work? they work. Should you do it? There are safer ways now. So for example, in hoodoo, they would use bluing balls, which is a very harsh detergent that would be used in laundries. Does it work to clean you on a spiritual level as well as physical? Yes. Should you do that? It's a really harsh chemical. And part of the situation there is that you were dealing with very poor people who were doing laundry and they had access to that. That doesn't mean that there aren't safer options now. And I, I want to take a moment and actually talk about that because you'll find that in a lot of different magical traditions. Whenever you're looking at anything, many of our ancestors and many different traditions, you have had people who were poor, who were oppressed, who were in a situation and a climate where there were not safer alternatives. And so just because something is traditional, if there are safer alternatives now that we now have access to that are just as effective, use those. So, you know, there are an awful lot of, of traditions that come out of this was the best available at the time. And frankly, there are things that are safer and better available now. So, you know, go with those. Um, so yeah, so don't put anything in your bath that is unsafe to consume because your body is taking it in. Okay. So a few of the cleansing washing things that I can recommend. Um, any of these are great charged up. As I said, I personally use a lot of Daphne. I use a lot of Bay. Um, part of that is because of my work with Apollon, but Apollon is the healer. Um, Bay is absolutely purifying. And that is, like I said, at the root of all healing is cleansing and hygiene. So you can make teas out of it. There's bay water, there's bay rum, any number of things. Sink foil, five fingered grass, that also works. You turn that into a tea, put it in there. Hyssop. Hyssop is very protective, but it's also cleansing. And you can use it as a strewing plant, like you can put it on the ground if you're outside in a circle. And, you know, that's one of the ways in which it was traditionally used, actually, in a lot of uh, temple sanctuaries. Um, but you can also, again, make it into, you can use a bit of the oil. You can do any number of things. Vetiver. 
Vetiver is really, really good at cleansing. And I'm gonna call out Vetiver here for a moment because it is particularly good for people who are dealing with something that has been traumatic. And that is what they are trying to kind of heal and cleanse is that they are dealing with some sort of traumatic situation. And I have found that vetiver and hyssop, which I have used to make some bath salts, is particularly useful when you're dealing with someone who is trying to cleanse and process from trauma. And of course, salt. There's a lot of different types of salt. They sometimes have slightly different resonance, but salt is a major purifier and can be added into any bath. And I tend to use that as an ingredient pretty much all the time. Smudging. So smudging is when you're using soap. Uh, smoke to purify the subtle levels of being. Basically what you're doing is you're burning the purifying incense and you're wafting it over your etheric body. And you know, if you've never had somebody help you smudge before to really get it over every bit of like your back area, a lot of times because you know, we're eyes face forward, we often forget about our backs. It's an amazing experience to really just have somebody cleansing you all the way off. Um, so basically, you know, if you get good smoke going, that can clean off the gunk. And it also, if you're paying attention to both how it feels and how it looks, it can often show you where there may be some blockages in your subtle physiology, where there might be some intrusions and so forth. The other thing is a lot of the incense it can raise the vibration. And so, you know, a lot of times what I will work on doing is doing some cleansing and then raising the vibration. So a couple of those in particular that really are great at raising vibration are frankincense and angelica. Um, also, again, bay laurel does do this and do it very well, but the leaves themselves burn super quickly. It is a part of the ritual incense that I use when I'm doing the Monty's work for a bolon. And so believe me, I have been working on a whole bunch of different things, including with some ex other experts who are great with incense to try and come up with ways for the bay laurel to not burn as fast, but it burns super quickly. So you would want to mix it, and I've mixed it a lot with, uh, with frankincense. Um, Sweetgrass. Sweetgrass also works, which is one of our First Nations um, kind of uh, types. Now, white sage. Does white sage purify? Yes, it does. But there's a lot of problems with burning white sage, and that is that it is often not sustainably harvested, and it is um, being taken to fill a lot of kind of stores of those of us who are working on kind of a spiritual path, but to the point where there are times in which it's not available for the First Nations practitioners for whom this is really kind of a, a sacred plant to them. So therefore, because we have other options, what I would say is this, if you have some already, sure, use it. But I would strongly encourage you to not purchase and therefore be part of this supply chain thing that is beginning to make white sage um, not as available to First Nations practitioners. There are other options. So I would encourage you not to buy it, get something else. Um, another one is hyssop. You can use hyssop for a lot of these sorts of things. You can also use hyssop and hyssop water for asperging. Okay, basically, honestly, I love frankincense. I mean, it's such good stuff. <laughs> and you know, and there are some other some other things like that. So also just experiment and see. But most of these work um, primarily by raising the vibrations. So there's other forms of more personal cleansing. There are sweat lodges and ritual saunas. Now the Assembly of the Sacred Wheel has its own kind of Wiccan protocol for a sweat lodge. The reality is that sweat lodges and ritual saunas have been in almost every culture and there are different ways of doing them and there is something very purifying about sweating out all the toxins. Now you wanna be sure that you are physically able to do this safely um, and you, know, you might want to experiment 
And if you have any respiratory kind of situation, then that is something to pay very careful attention to because it does you no good to be purifying yourself in ways that cause you physical harm. That is counterproductive. Uh, for myself, I find that saunas, um, and you can do this in a ritual way because that's turning it into a ritual and there are ritual aspects to this uh, in terms of when they were originally created. For me, I have difficulty with steam. It tends to um, constrict my breathing. Another form that is very potent, powerful, and in a whole lot of different cultures is fasting. And again, like the sweat lodges and the ritual saunas, you want to be sure that you can medically safely do this. But a period of fasting is something that is not just purifying on the body. Part of what it's doing is it is allowing various kinds of energies to move out of your system and it also is doing something in which it is focusing your attention in a different way. I interestingly find nettles to be interestingly cleansing. So nettles themselves, this is one of my spirit allies, it's a plant ally. Um, nettles doesn't tend to sting me unless I ask it to. And when it does, I personally find that there is a weird form of etheric cleansing that happens. I haven't done this in a while. I don't have ready access to them anymore. But um, that's like another thing. But again, that's another one. You gotta be sure that it is going to be physically safe for you. You can also do things like a special purification with lights for a certain number of days. Like, you know, take a purification bath and then sit in front of a candle for X number of days. Sometimes this is something to do along with a particular other form of rite. Uh, you know, if what you're doing is taking in the light or, you know, if there's, if it's the equivalent of like a novena sort of situation where what you're doing is working with a particular power or a particular spell for a, a set of time. There's also very special expiation and purification rituals. Um, we have more of these that we know about from historical reasons. And personally, I think as we're talking about the development of alternative culture in paganism, that it would be a worthwhile project, should anyone want to take this on, to develop more of these and to test them and share them. So for example, there was a very specific expiatory ritual that was done as part of the lesser mysteries for the Eleusinian mysteries that would purify those who had shed human blood, but in a way that was not, they were not morally culpable. So this was originally created for Eurycles. But you know, when I'm thinking and, and what it does, because even if you're not morally culpable still in taking a human life, there's pollution with that. So I think that it would be a worthwhile endeavor when we think about the number of our soldiers who come back and they have things like PTSD and they have trauma. If there are things that we could do that would help with the purification side, because again, this idea of like, you want to heal something, you got to purify it first. Cleansing and purification is, is a part and it's like got to be kind of, it's not exactly preliminary, it is part of the healing process, but it's a first step, you've got to do that. Similarly, if we are releasing people from prison and trying to help them go back into the community, you know, something where they can leave all that behind and be purified from it. If we have, we have so many people who go through various forms of trauma and, you know, I think that there are reasons why when we have something really traumatic happen to us, one of our first most natural inclinations is to want to take a bath. And, you know, if we could find ways to add in and create various kinds of purification for this, I think it would be really helpful. So 
and putting that out there into the cosmos. Also, you know, we don't have good rituals of how to cleanse the body politic, how to cleanse the community. And I was recently in a different video talking about the original purpose of theater as a way of cleansing the body politic through catharsis. So in times in which there was a king and you had miasma, you had poison in the body politic, the way in which you would deal with that ritually would be to ritually purify the king as the embodiment of the body politic. We are in a democracy. So there is no king. You can't purify the king. That doesn't work. So the original reason, like theater grew up in ancient Athens along with democracy, because what theater does is it is a ritual dedicated to the Onisos, dedicated to Dionysus, in which the body politic is cleansed. Catharsis means cleansing through the identification with the causes of miasma and then things are set, um, you know, there's the, the tragedy and you are able to pull all of this up and identify it with it as the entire audience as well as the people who are doing the performance and like purge it. So, you know, I think that we need to find some other ways of dealing with this. Also, I'm going to point out that after the Persian War, all of the hearths across Greece at the um, insistence of Apollon through the Oracle at Delphi were put out and the um, delegations from Delphi took fire from the sacred hearth and relit all of the other hearths because the Persian War was, even though they won, it was hugely um, polluting. And so to move out of like this war, this situation in which they had been at war, they put out the living flame and then they rekindled it from Delphi. So, you know, this, this point is that there were ways and there were techniques for us as societies to do kinds of cleansing, purification rituals of the body politic of our societies. And that is not something that we have now. And I think it would benefit us to develop them. Okay, so moving on, we've talked a lot about, we've talked a lot about like, how do you cleanse yourself, like daily stuff. And then, you know, um, in special circumstances, let's talk about clearing space. So first of all, whenever you're cleansing a space, you want to really open your inner senses and pay attention to your impulses and your intuition. And if you feel yourself being drawn towards that corner, then like pay attention to that and go towards that corner. So first of all, when you're in a new home, one of the traditional ways of dealing with this is to ritually sweep with a new broom and you start up at the top and you sweep all the energy out and then you sweep it out the door. And if you need to come up from a basement, then you sweep up and you take it out the door. You can also, of course, sweep any particular, if you have a ritual broom, you can sweep any particular place, but you're paying attention and using that as a mechanism for sweeping out the energy. And that's actually what you're after in this circumstance. You can also zero base like the energy in a spot using an Epsom salt fire, but I'm going to tell you, um, you can find instructions for this. Follow all of the safety instructions. Super powerful, super effective. You don't want to be purifying your space by burning your house down. <laughs> so, you know, be sure that you're really following the instructions and that you have things on a, um, it's very, very hot, that you have things on an appropriate surface. A spurging. A spurging is where you have some blessed water or some blessed water with particular kind of herbs and so forth um, in it or oils, and you are flinging. Okay, so you're flinging it about. Um, you know, I sometimes use a hyssop wand, like bundle of hyssop, because that's a very good way to do it. Um, and, you know, fling the water about. Um, obviously, it's got to be stuff that you're not going to mess up by getting a little wet. There's also, uh, in various magical traditions, a large um, 
tradition of floor washes, which this is, you know, blessing particular mixtures to wash the floor so that anything that crosses the floor is purified and that, you know, you're cleansing all of that. Uh, what I can tell you is if you decide to use floor washes, um, and if you are in a place that has cheap compressed wood for your flooring, be a little wary. I did that once in an apartment. It was not so good. So be careful with that. So you're cleansing, you're getting rid of stuff, and then you want to raise the vibrations. And again, um, much like with the other stuff, frankincense, angelica, Daphne Bay laurel, you can also use certain tones and bells. Like I sometimes will like walk through and use bells at particular tones to kind of raise the vibration. You can intentionally carry a light, you know, light a candle, something that you have lit and charged for that purpose. You can also, if you know how to do this, like pull up and there's a sacred spot here that is like between, you have these three centers in the head, the one at the brain stem, your third eye, and then your crown. And then there's like a spot in the middle, like where all those converge on the inside. And if you can pull up brilliant bright light and explode it from there, you can clear a room. All right, but as with, you know, your cleansing of yourself, for your space, you wanna have a kind of schedule maintenance situation. And, um, you can do this like trying to time it to various kinds of cycles like the moon like you know things of that nature but basically good maintenance keeps you from having to do more extreme measures just like if you keep your house relatively straight then you're not going to have to go through the hugely panicked cleaning up if you decide to have a dinner party so you want to check in on a regular schedule basically like walk through focused in your astral form and check it and bring light to it, you know, just doing that. Periodically burning incense that raises vibrations. And then I would say the more that you can incorporate checking in on the astral level while you're just doing your actual physical cleaning, I mean, why not just like combine those things? Um, you know, that would get you to do it probably more regularly. And then, you know, the other thing you can do is you can set kind of maintenance workings or negative energy traps, which basically are kind of, um, things that you can do where you have like a bowl in which, you know, it's got some salt, it's got some filtery stuff and you kind of like have a vortex set up. So it's, it's pulling negative energy in there, but then you got to remember to clean that. If, um, make sure that that's okay. Um, maintenance workings, this again, this would be something like, you know, you have uh, energy set up in a particular place to, to kind of like cleanse and tell you when things are not as okay. But for the most part, I think, honestly, if you can incorporate this idea that you are working on cleansing while you're cleaning your house, then that's gonna be a lot of that kind of, you know, combined effort. And that's probably the better way to incorporate it. So normal ritual purification, when we do like our everyday rituals, you know, a lot of times what we're doing really is salt water and incense. So the deal there is salt water and incense, that's all four elements. So your charged salt water, salt, earth, water, obviously water. And what I do is I take it and I am blessing it with the witch fire. And by the witch fire, I mean, you know, in a candle, that blue color that's real close to the wick, it's that color. That is the color of magic power. And that also, it's the color of the sun. We can't perceive it with our eyes, but that's the color of the sun. And that's actually why the assembly's um, colors are that blue. It's because it's that, that's the color of magic. So if you pull what I do, I pull down through my crown chakra, through here, at the same time that I'm taking a breath and pulling up, and then out my mouth, I see, and I blow into the water, that color blue. So I'm like, and I blow it into the water until I see the water glowing with that color. And then I see the blue flames, that blue kind of power in the water when I'm using it for my purification or when I'm going around the room, seeing it 
as blue kind of flames purifying everything. Incense, the fire in the air is what those are. And again, you want to see it as kind of living its own living essence while you're wafting it around yourself and around your space. So basically though, like a lot of times if it's a big ritual, we do what we're calling like the car wash thing where you wash through and somebody's like waving incense and stuff at you on your way in. Just go ahead and accept it, take it into yourself, take that moment to basically put your mundane self outside and step into a different mindset and into your magical persona. It's a really good moment to kind of flip that switch on. So let's move on to protection, shielding and warding. Uh, what's the difference between shielding and warding? Okay, so shielding, a shield is basically something that goes around a being and it goes with you. It moves around with you. Whereas a ward is around a place. It's around some place that's more set and stable. So let's talk personal protection here. So for daily life, you do want some protection, but you don't want to go through life like you're suited up for battle. I mean, that's just not good form. It will make you perceived as very aggressive and you might even draw the attention of some entities that are like, mm, look at them walking around. You know, I mean, there is something to be said about like going through in, in a little bit more um, vulnerable position because the other thing you don't want to do is cut yourself off from the world that's not useful so one of the things i would recommend though is, is work on developing the kind of tells that help you sense when you're in danger and when you need to put up your shields so you know work on those spidey sense developing the spidey sense because then that will tell you those moments in which you need to go oh shields up so um you know, for myself, I do this thing every every morning with a bowl on in which I'm like, you know, cause my skin to crawl away from every evil thing. And what that means is there's a very specific visceral like kind of thing that I get, even though sometimes stuff looks totally normal when I get that. I know that I need to like do some quick protection. So you want to build some of that into kind of your practice. And that can just be a, a daily practice sort of thing where you're just building in your awareness of when things feel off and then pay attention to that. And then um, you might want to consider when you're doing like your cleansing, just incorporating a quick scan of your aura to look for weak spots. Because typically if you're going to be attacked, it's because you're weak someplace, you know. And by the way, the vast majority of people are not attacked on a regular basis. That doesn't mean, but there's like, when you're in a situation and humans bump up against each other a lot, kind of the, the aggravation, the upset, the kind of like pokey stuff that we sort of do at each other, that can be kind of damaging on a sort of physiological level. So you wanna, um, it's gonna go into your weak spots. So just try not to have them. And you can try not to have them by paying attention. And in particular, pay attention to your back. Pay attention to your back. That's where, you know, the kind of being stabbed in the back thing. Well, part of that is because we ignore our backs and we don't tend to like be strong back there. So pay attention. All right. So shields, there's lots of different methods, but one of the big things is that they need energy behind them and not just visualization. Just visualizing something is not sufficient. And now I just want to do a grand confessional and say that this is not an area of magic that I am as good at as I have had to be helped a number of times, but I can tell you what some of my mistakes are and I'm getting better. So <laughs> um, part of it is, like I said, you know, visualization is insufficient. It has to have real energy behind it. And this is part of where it is very difficult to be a totally solitary practitioner because I was solitary for a really long time and my visualization was so good. And you know what it wasn't? It wasn't actually working. And I didn't know that because I didn't have anybody to come along and poke at me. And then I could be like, oh, oh, that's what you just got right through that. And that's what that feels like when someone's poking at me. Well, that happens all the damn time. Okay, I guess my shields kind of suck. So this is something we're working with a group and in person is really important because that's where you figure out whether or not it's really working. And I can tell you what my, my particular challenge there was in addition to the visualization thing. It's also that for me, I was mushing things together. So 
the most common is like this, imagine yourself surrounded in an egg of light, you're surrounding yourself in light. So that's the one I was trained with, that's the one I was doing, and then it was not working. And part of the reason it wasn't working is because a huge part of my work is being a beacon, being, you know, I'm, I'm priestess of a bullone, right? So being a beacon, shining light, all of these different things, that's a huge part of what I was doing, which is way too close to that shielding form. And so what that means is while I'm out there going like, I touch the world through my light and all that kind of stuff, it's like that is not a boundary. <laughs> so I was choosing a form that was way, way, way too close to my open givingness that was then supposed to be my shielding form and not a surprise, it didn't actually keep anything out. Okay, so that may not be a problem for you. That may work really, really well for you is the kind of idea of the egg of light. Another thing though that a lot of people do and do very effectively is the visualization of more like um, a net in which you know it's open, things can come through, it's a delineated boundary, but you can pull it tight if you need to. There's also like this idea of geometric barriers for those people who are really good at visualizing forms uh, with kind of hard barriers. The one that works for me, but I'm difficult, I find it difficult to do consistently is um, mirrors, like circling mirrors. I find that I can do it. That did seem to work better when my compatriots were poking at me, but it's hard for me to hold that visualization. Um, there's also a lot of times, maybe you don't need to be shielded. Maybe you just need to be not noticed. Being not noticed can work even better than actually carrying around giant shields. So there's invisibility cloaks. There's also like that kind of TV static stuff you can do and put that on you. And honestly, the one that works the best for me, if I really need to, is when I walk around in an avatar kind of situation. In other words, like, I am now standing in my magical persona in which I'm like a huge freaking powerful being. Now, that isn't exactly shielding, that's me calling on that part of myself, but it does mean that stuff tends to stay away from me more. <laughs> um, but I don't do that all the time. So anyway, I will say that this is one of those things that like working with other people and I am getting better, I'm getting better, but this is not one and we'll go through why in a minute. Um, and I, I just told you some of it. This is not personally something that is as easy for me. So what that means is that I need to really work on having some triggers because it is on, um, something that takes a little bit more effort. So therefore I have to build in systems. So one of them is these are the things that help you get your, um, your shields up. Amulets. This is a ring that is on, um, it has a Gorgon on it and it is from uh, ancient Macedonia. So it's an ancient coin ring that I have turned into um, coin that's been put into a ring and I use this to help me like basically in that one you know with that kind of avatar thing if I needed to I can take on the form of a organ that for whatever reason is easier for me to do than visualizing geometric shapes so you know do work with your strengths here um but the other thing is that you can do words and phrases like said shields up you know i mean that's one number of people use if you just have that and have that ability to pull that in you can have various gestures if there are things that you need um very fast visualizations but the point is you want to practice these enough so that they become second nature in a crisis this is kind of like why you do things like bomb threat training so that if you actually get a bomb threat in that moment when it's really kind of scary you know what to do when your training kicks in and you're not trying to remember everything all right so the great ones and spirit beings um they can protect you and i have been definitely definitely protected i have had serious situations in which i have been protected by some of the great ones um and this is especially if you are in close relationship with them but but they don't experience time and space like we do, and they will often respond after you call them rather than preemptively protecting you. 
you know, because they're not necessarily experiencing things the way in which you are. And I can say that a lot of the times in which I've been preemptively protected by some of the great ones that are closest to me, um, it has been in situations that I think were probably more apparent to them that they were coming, such as like when I was protected in a very significant and like visceral, meaningful way in the Northridge earthquake um, versus like when I just fell down the stairs, you know, that kind of thing. So sometimes it's like they're not necessarily perceiving and often that has been more in a time in which it has been something very external that is tied into even bigger patterns that might be more apparent that they're happening then. But for the most part, like you can call to them and that's not a bad thing to do, but that's different than preemptive um, protection. So other challenges. All right, now I don't have any way to determine this at this moment scientifically, but it is my observation, both from myself and observing many others, that I believe that many people's psychic abilities originate perhaps from having bad boundaries. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you think about like empathy as being one of the, the kind of foundational skills, um, that's great. And sometimes that comes from not having great boundaries and not being able to tell like where you end and where others begin. So um, I know that I certainly have been working for decades on getting better boundaries than I have naturally. Shielding requires clear boundaries <laughs> between yourself and others. So I am gonna say, if you are a person who has bad boundaries, then working on that is kind of a prerequisite in many ways to being able to effectively shield. Um, in addition to that, those of us who do have that kind of desire to be psychically connecting, that tends to kind of get in our way sometimes with shielding, where it's like, you know, I don't like to feel cut off. So I have kind of a resistance on some level. So I am attempting to deal with all that, but I think that is part of the root of why I am not as good at shielding as I aspire to someday be, although I am better than I have been. Uh, the other thing just to remember is that great visualization does not ensure good energetic work. You've got to have like the energy moving as well as the picture of it. And if part of your work is being a beacon and so forth, don't have your protection work be too similar or it won't work. And that's part of what I was saying. I'm like, I'm all given light. I'm going to give light to the world. And then I'm going to like, and I'm going to surround myself with light to protect myself, which means that one of these is all about not having a barrier. And the other one is about having a barrier. And what it really just means I didn't have a barrier. Okay. So work on strengthening your etheric energy. Um, that's necessary. Like I said, you got to have the energy behind it. There's some exercises that can be done there. And then practice before you are in a crisis. Now, wards. These should be set after you've purified your space. So you always want to purify your space first because you don't want to like, you know, put up a, a, a clear boundary that makes it hard for things to get out um, as well as in if it's not cleaned up first. So you want to cleanse first. And then part of what you want to do is delineate the boundaries of whatever space it is that you're warding. So some of the ways to do this is to do some workings in which the idea is that those with will intent will feel turned away, like, you know, they'll come up and they'll feel kind of uncomfortable. And so they'll like go away because, you know, when we talk about being uh, existing on all those different levels of being, it's not just magical practitioners who are, I mean, you know, the, the middle self, that talking self, the tip of the iceberg there, it's like, that's for all humans. So you know, that's the kind of thing that makes an awful lot of people just not understand why they're doing something that they're just doing. It's so a part of it is you want to speak to that part of the other people that tells them, if you're coming here with bad intent, this isn't a safe place to be doing that, so go away. And, you know, that's the kind of idea that they will pick up on that and, and not choose you. Uh, you also, though, you do want it to be welcoming for those invitings, invited, so it's not just forbidding. And this is kind of like the, it's bad form to wander through life constantly ready for battle. 
Um, you know, you want to have your household be warm and comforting and inviting and hospitable for those beings who are invited there. So, you know, when you're figuring out your workings, you need to be putting some of that kind of idea into place. Um, one of the things that I do, and I actually do this in uh, some of the rituals as we are putting some working around the sacred space conference, you know, peace to all those who enter, joy to those who depart. That's a way of bringing in this kind of like, you know, here we are under the rules of hospitality and I am welcoming you in, but you are in here under specific kind of rules. And then, you know, and may this experience that you've had here be a blessing as you leave. So the other thing that you can do, um, again, if you wanted to, is you can do more of an invisibility or a confusion spell. If it's something where it's like you just, you know, that's the, the Grimald place for those who are Harry Potter fans, you know, the idea that um, people just won't see it, but there's problems with that. And so uh, if you are going to do it that way, and I'm not sure that I would recommend it. I'm, I'm honestly not sure that I would recommend doing it that way unless you were in an area where there was really a need is you got to make sure that those people who need to find it can find it. That's going to include the ambulance, the police, if you need to call them, the fire department, the people delivering your pizza, you know, the people you invite, you need to have some way if you're going to do that, where there are beings who have the ability to get through there. I mean, I, I remember visiting um, a practitioner who we're just like, man, there's like a confusion spell on this. It's just obscured from reality. We drove by that house like eight times before we found it. And I'm like, all right then. Well, I see you have cloaked yourself well from your neighbors and everyone else. So that's just something to be aware of. So I'm not sure, especially because you always want an ambulance in the fire department to be able to find you. I'm not sure that's really the best way to go. But there may be reasons why you might need to do it. So just build that in. Okay. Methods. Crystal net. Um, you know, and many thanks to Karen Brewing for, uh, she's the one who walked me through doing this. Um, basically, you've got to have some way to feed it, but you have, you know, crystals that are charged up and planted in like the, all the boundary areas up and down. And then I have them like all over. And then I have a, um, a crystal through which I can feed energy to the entire net. Another thing, uh, and you know, these are not mutually exclusive, by the way, you can have multiple different types. Servitor guardians, these are um, a really common one that you see are enlivened statues that are linked to servitors. Servitors are artificial, um, they're like artificial uh, life forms that are there doing certain things and given certain jobs. And you can have them for protecting various kinds of uh, areas. So, you know, a lot of times when you go into a place, you'll, you'll find some of these. So I have, um, I have statues of Gorgons around because Greek, right? Um, but you know, you'll, you'll see these in a lot of different places and they have purposes. Ikos office, that is the house snake. So in ancient Greece, you would have a house snake. That house snake would, among other things, eat mice and rats and make them not want to be any place close to your house. And in addition to that, um, it was a protector spirit of the ecos, which ecos is a house. It's where we get, you know, economics, ecology, whatever. It's the ecos on um, the household. So I have found that you can use the form of a snake very, very well as kind of a protector. There's also the abolon I use that is a form of abolon that is the abolon of the roads. So a lot of times like right on the boundary, they would have um, a, uh, a stone that you would put garlands on. And the idea there is that it is, it is protection um, of that boundary between the house and the street and it protects both. Um, again, it's not like abolon is there in every moment. It is a servitor that is there, but it's keyed to him and he can be called quickly if necessary. 
but all of these have to be fed by attention and energy. And sometimes there are particular things like pouring some olive oil, doing whatever, but you gotta create some sort of mechanism to make sure that they are fed. Other considerations, you wanna pay special attention to ensuring that you have some protection over your doors, your windows, entries and exits of the house, that would be your electrical and your plumbing. You know, you can do kind of a, um, as you're setting everything up, you can do a, a blue witch fire pentacle over them um, to seal them up, or really it's more like a filter, because it's not like you don't want electricity and, and water coming in and out of your house, but you know, you just wanna be sure that there's nothing unwholesome coming in with it. And then mirrors, mirrors are doorways, and you need to know that. So like you need to put some filters up on your mirrors. I do have mirrors that I use for ritual purposes, but you want to kind of include them. I also have like, sometimes you can put mirrors on the outside so that like they're, the mirror is um, on a window with the mirror part pointing outside. And that also works as kind of a, a warding situation. Um, I use a lot of the eyes too around the house. So the other thing you can do is you, you do want to check in if you are moving into a new place and see whether or not there are any other spirit beings who live in that space with whom you might need to negotiate relationships. Um, sometimes there are various beings, nature beings who are in that space already and you know we want to find appropriate relationships with them. Uh, so you know, those are all things to just check in when you're getting a new place. Transportation. Create some sort of fast working for surrounding your vehicle with protection. So, you know, this is a little bit different because I said a lot of times, depending on what it is that you want to do, having something where you are not noticed is just as good as having a big shield. You know where you don't want that to be? In traffic. You want to be noticeable in traffic. Always be careful of that particular one. So, especially when you're doing something like you're driving, you wanna focus on making yourself really visible to others while you travel, because the, the bigger thing is not so, that somebody is gonna be bad to you, the bigger problem is that somebody's not gonna see you. So also you can call on your instinctual self to be alert and intercede in danger. And, I recommend having some sort of protective amulet that makes you realize on all levels of your being that you and everyone who is your passenger is safe and I have mine hanging around the rear view mirror and you know and I have like some stuff that I often will do when I, I first start up the car. So your homework. Said so last time we did grounding and centering. This time let's send to number one. Create some sort of plan for yourself to incorporate spiritual cleansing into your daily routine. Write it down and work with it for a month and revise as necessary. And by this, I mean like as you are doing the stuff you would be doing anyway, figure out ways to incorporate cleansing of your various energy and subtle bodies. Assignment number two, experience a lustral bath. So I'm going to encourage you to choose either a full or a new moon and create a ritual where the ritual itself is the lustral bath. And for this, intentionally create connecting with the materials, something to go in your bath for purification. I gave you some of the earlier ones, but you can look at other things as well, but some sort of either a, a salt, a salt mixture, herbs, a tea, whatever it is, something that's gonna go in your bath that you are making. Choose your incense, charge up a candle, intentionally draw your bath, charging the water and see it fill with purifying energy, and then be in the bath as a return to the amniotic fluid of the Great Mother and allow yourself to be nurtured and reset. See all that does not serve, leave you, feel it leave you, be open to anything that you receive while you are there and stay until your guidance says you are ready. Now, check that because sometimes in purification, it's sometimes it's not comfortable and you get edgy and you wanna move around and you're like feeling very ADHD kind of thing. And you gotta like stop and check and see, 
are you feeling like you're done because you're actually done or are you feeling like you're done because there is stuff that needs to be purified and doesn't want to be so check in you had in the last time where you were establishing methods for checking in with yourself so once your guidance says as you're ready be intentional as the bath drains dress yourself sit with a candle and record some of your experiences so you have that and you can look back on it and then i would recommend that maybe seven days later go back and reread that and see how you feel and whether or not it seems to have had any effect that went over that that week Assignment number three, shielding, experiment with it. Um, create some sort of daily affirmation that helps you instruct your dreaming self to alert you to danger. Like I said, I have the one that I do, which has to do with, you know, holy Lord, my Lord, if alone cause my skin to crawl away from every evil thing. Um, choose some sort of triggering mechanism to help you get your shields up, be it saying something like shields up or, you know, something where you are able to grab an amulet and remind yourself to something like that that can help you do it really fast. And then hopefully, whenever it is that we are finally able, because I am recording this during the pandemic, we are able to be together in person. We need to experiment in person with working on our shields because there's only so much you can do about that and really test it by yourself. Assignment number four, your house. So if you have not already cleansed and boarded your house, then make a plan to do so. So this takes some time. It's better to do it right than to do it fast. Basically, you want to find a way to clean out the stagnant energy, increase the vibrations, choose some sort of method for warding, and then make sure you have something in all of the corners, the highest and lowest spots, seal the entries with an energetic filter, and set some sort of a mechanism to feed your wards. So just make a plan and give it a go. But like I said, that one is, is more important to do intentionally than to do it on a schedule. Assignment five, if you have a car, get or make an amulet for it, something that says protection or blessing to you. Create a brief trigger and ritual for you to affirm that all that you and all those who are riding with you are safe, all drivers will see you clearly, your car is surrounded in safety, and you will be intuitively alert to anything you need to know when you need to know it. So create some sort of a quick working for that. And that now is the end of this Praxis section. So thank you for joining me.